Well, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. It's Jim Clemmer. Delighted that you could uh, make it here today to uh, take a look at uh, executive team building and culture development. We have over 300 sites that are registered from 20 countries. So we're hoping, I hope to bring you in the next little while, uh, a webinar that's worth much more than you're paying for it. Hopefully you'll walk away with, uh, with lots of good ideas and, uh, and perhaps some insights into some of the points here around leveraging your team, your organization, how to integrate, bring everything together, build a foundation, or perhaps renew some of the culture change, culture work that you're doing, and uh, cascade this down through the organization. So that's a very high-level overview of some of what we're going to be talking about here. As we go along, this is more of a webcast than a webinar. I'll be casting and broadcasting a lot of these ideas. But uh, we do look very much for your input, questions, uh, any comments you might have. So you'll find uh, on, your, um, on your screen uh, something that looks a bit like this that is indicating where you can enter any questions. And I'll be leaving some time at the end of the presentation to try to address some of those. So what I'm going to try to do is bring you, uh, I've been in the business a few years now, a couple of decades of experience. Uh, that has come from the research I've continued to do, a lot of my own personal applications and working with lots of other organizations, and uh, seven different books now. This one actually is many hairs ago, my very first book, going back a few years now, uh, and other books that have all been in around the areas of leadership, organization effectiveness, and personal growth, and how all of those integrate together. On our website, You'll find hundreds of blogs and columns. It's quite a large site, lots of information there. We've uh, put it into really three main sections. So there's a section, this is the front page of the website. You'll see some material on keynotes, workshops, retreats. And so some of the things I've touched on here today, if you'd like to explore a little further or look at how I might be able to, how we might be able to help you with that, then uh, you can dig down a little more here. Well, you also find a section on Zenger Folkman, which is a relatively new partnership. It's been about three years now that uh, we've very much enjoyed working with Zenger Folkman and their outstanding materials. And I'll touch on some of the research and some of their work a little bit later on. And today, we're focusing mostly on this section or component of our website that has to do with a lot of very customized kind of work. And so that's a bit of the dilemma in bringing this material to you is that it's most times fairly customized to the situation or to the organization. So in, uh, in the next few minutes, what we're going to cover at 35,000 feet, to use that, that analogy, we're going to be taking a high-level overview of some pretty big topics. We're going to cover a lot of ground. We're going to talk, first of all, about how culture ripples out from the executive team, the critical role that the executive team plays in culture development. We're going to look at why is it that there's such a high failure rate for culture or any sort of change initiatives. And we'll look at what some of the research is showing on what those failure rates are, but then dig down into what are some of the root causes. We'll talk about various ways retreats, which is typically how we begin a lot of culture work or put together executive team building, executive development, and culture. We'll look at how a lot of those retreats might be configured, some of the configuration or customizing options. And then we'll look at a typical framework, a typical approach that is usually over two days. Sometimes uh, it's broken up into smaller pieces or could even extend to three days. And uh, we'll finish up with the payoffs of an executive retreat, what we've certainly seen having run literally hundreds of these now over the last few decades. And then finish or conclude with what are some of the next steps, some of the options to go from here. So let's jump right in. Got lots of ground to cover here. So fasten your seatbelts, and we're about to take off. All right. So first, take a look at this whole issue of failure of many uh, improvement efforts. Over the last few decades, there have been literally hundreds of studies that have looked at a wide variety of change initiatives, from restructuring to all sorts of IT projects and implementations to uh, new management structures and organizations, to things like Lean and Six Sigma and customer service, uh, or just culture change itself. 
And what's emerged from that, as we see in this, uh, this bit of, of work from the Harvard Business Review article on cracking the code of change, that most of those initiatives have a pretty low success rate. That is after two or three years, typically, is how this gets measured. Uh, there, really, there really isn't much change. And if you look at four or five years, there's very little lasting legacy. In fact, by then, people are kind of on to the second or third round of, well, what's next? And so the brutal fact, as is said here, is that about 70% of many of these efforts actually fail. So it depends on how you look at this. You can look at it as being, glass, as being a half to two-thirds of these are failing, or you can look at the flip side, a third to a half are having a major impact. So whether you're looking at the glass as half full or half empty, I guess depends a lot on your perspective. Or if you're into re-engineering, another one of those efforts that went by the wayside in many organizations, you could say, well, clearly the glass is, there's twice as much glass here as is required. So the critical factor that emerges in all of this is that leadership and culture, the so-called soft skills, are, or soft elements, play a huge impact on hard outcomes. They either boost or block a lot of efforts like these, uh, typical sorts of improvement efforts. Now, what causes the problem? Well, it gets a little bit difficult to untangle because the root causes are like a gnarled old root system that uh, the exact causes are quite intertwined. And there's never any one or sometimes even two. There's often a couple that are interconnected. But one that emerges to the top time and time again is the executive team, their behavior, and how they model the behavior patterns that get set for the entire organization. So we have, for years, uh, concluded this statement and have quite a bit of research to back it up, that an organization's culture ripples out from the executive team that's leading it. So what we get, to a large extent, is what we are, or the famous words of Gandhi, we must be the change that we want to see in this world. Well, uh, years ago I was doing a uh, retreat with an executive team. And we did a bit of assessment work ahead of the retreat. And the leader of the, uh, the retreat saw this work before we went into the retreat and we used it in designing it. And he became, it became very clear, this very problem we're looking at, that the executive team was at the root of many of the issues that the organization was having. And so before we began, he had made, a, made up a little portfolio, a little uh, personal uh, notebook type portfolio on every table on the table for everybody, and put at the beginning, please don't open until we begin. And then, and also below that was, change begins here. And when you open it up, inside was a big mirror. And it was a very graphic way of making the point that the extraordinary, the, the, the leadership team, the executive team, is the key catalyst. What we're seeing here is, is some research done by Zenger Folkman that looks at 16 in total characteristics of successful teams that are split into five main clusters or five main headings. And this is, again, um, similar to their other research using 360 data, is identifying what are the key differences of either ineffective or highly effective teams. And so when we start to look at those characteristics and how they get assessed, so this chart is showing across the bottom, using 360 data, how the team is assessed in its effectiveness on those dimensions we just saw. And over on the left side, we see how that correlates to levels of, executive, of employee commitment. And of course, there's a very, very strong correlation. Or here's one showing the correlation to turnover, where we see the executive teams that are assessed as being the most effective are leading organizations with the lowest levels of turnover. Or we can look at profitability, similar pattern that develops here, that there's a strong correlation and direct correlation between how effective the team is across those behaviors or characteristics and their, uh, their levels of profitability. Now, there's lots of other research along these same, li same lines, safety, customer service levels, quality. Just giving you a quick sample here 
and trying to buttress the argument that there is a direct and strong correlation between how effective the executive team is as a team and their leadership skill and the culture of the organization. To make that point, that culture ripples out from the executive team that's leading it. So let's take a look then at what are some failure factors that trip up many executive teams and contribute to this problem of uh, culture change or other changes not being effectively implemented. These aren't in any particular order, and I invite you as I go through them to start doing a bit of self-assessment here. We often do, as you'll see later, more formalized sorts of assessments ahead of the speech. But here's a chance for you to do a little bit of uh, self-assessment. Or if you're watching this with some of your team members, maybe together you, or independently, you might want to do the assessment and then compare your answers afterwards. So what are some common failure factors? And I know anybody in the safety business be concerned about this graphic, the person about to fall. So first one is speed traps and tyranny of the urgent. There was once a, a sign, and, a, and I've kind of put it in here. I don't have the actual situation. But on a windy mountain road that said, slow down or die. <laughs> and that's a pretty dire warning, but it's certainly very true for many, many executive teams. Because many organizations and teams and individuals have fallen into the acceleration trap. It's been a series of studies and review and uh, articles written about this in Harvard Business Review and other places. But here's what these authors mean by the acceleration trap, is that it's uh, having uh, these over-accelerated firms uh, end up having very poor outcomes with performance and efficiency and productivity, and that in today's world particularly, it's getting much worse. In their study, which you see at the bottom of over 600 companies in the past nine years, over half of them were affected in one way or another. I'd be surprised if it wasn't even higher. It might be that they're, uh, they're studying some pretty high-performing organizations as well. But what's really interesting is that last comment, is a lot of organizations aren't even aware of how they're caught in this trap. It's just normal life for many people. So what are some of the signs that came out of this research? Well, three main things here. There is overloading where we keep adding on more and more things on the to-do list and uh, do very little of uh, taking things off the list. Multi-loading, where uh, the idea of multitasking is uh, being highly promoted and pushed on everybody, but that there isn't a lot of good focus and alignment amongst a lot of those activities. And thirdly, perpetual loading, where this feeling like this is just not going to end. We're imprisoned. We're trapped. In this, on this treadmill that just keeps going faster and faster and faster. So I invite you to think about to what extent does that describe your organization? Is it, I don't know, a scale of 1 to 10? Is it a 5, an 8, a 9, a 10? Where do you think you are on that one? Let's talk about another big problem that we see all the time, which is partial and piecemeal efforts. And that's where we see a number of initiatives like you are flashing on the screen here, that are all good, strong initiatives, make sense on their own. There's lots of argument to made, be made for them. Peter Drucker once called a, a champion, somebody who champions an initiative like you see here, as a monomaniac with a mission. So we've got champions who are pushing these initiatives through the organization, but they aren't connected together. And they're not going to fit together. In fact, if you look closely, and if any of you are uh, crossword puzzle uh, sectionados, you'll see that almost every piece in this graphic is an edge piece. And so it would be almost impossible to put this puzzle together. And that's so often what we see is this disconnect, this dis misalignment, where we have these piecemeal efforts that aren't well pulled together. Again, where do you think you are on this one? How do you think your organization is doing? How many efforts uh, have champions driving them through that in some cases may even be working at odds with other efforts? Well, let's look at leadership lip service. Now, this one we can really point back very directly or hold that mirror up to the executive team. And, uh, and we can use something that we call our commitment continuum. 
And I've used this in a lot of different retreat settings where we've gone through a process, a process of assessing either the team itself or people around the team, reporting to the team or part around the team, who assess where is the team across the commitment continuum, which is I'm going to show you across the bottom of this chart. So what this is designed to show is that if we are just at the first level of permission, where you're saying, yeah, we should go ahead, uh, here's some money, here's some budget, go make it happen, well, that might get some degree of change, not a lot. Next level is lip service. Well, I'm behind this, I agree with this, we ought to be rolling out this customer service program, we should be implementing this new uh, IT project, we should be restructuring the organization in such and such a way. Maybe I even get to the third level of ramping up the rhetoric. One organization, the CEO, is considered the chief evangelical officer for the whole effort. And there's nothing wrong with that. I want lots of an evangelism and enthusiasm for the effort, but that's unfortunately where it stopped. And so there really wasn't much beyond a lot of rhetoric. You ought to improve our teamwork. You ought to improve customer service. You need to learn how to work together better. You need to uh, be safer. You, well, it's all about how I or we can change you, how we, the executive team, can change everybody else. And of course, there's that well-worn adage that if we keep trying to do the same thing and expect different results, we're going to drive ourselves in. So the big jumping off point, the big differentiation point here is the degree of involved leadership. It's called sometimes walk the talk, lead by example, visible felt leadership is a term one organization used. But if we just continue on with the same talk, same blah, 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 we're going to actually see a fall off. And in fact, we're going to see an increase in the snicker factor. Oh, well, here we go again. What's the latest buzzwords? What's the latest fad? Where is this going to go now? However, if we see strong, active, visible, clear follow through that signals unequivocally strong commitment by example that leads the way to the change, uh, they're going to see that loud and clear and it's going to have a dramatic impact on the degree of change and will get us to the ultimate point of integration where this is just who we are and part of what's baked in to us, our values and our culture are baked in deep into the organization. So where do you think you are? Where's your executive team in terms of paying lip service, talking about how committed they are, but not really changing much in terms of action, but expecting different results? So we go on to then low culture or capacity building. And so in this case, we're perhaps not looking at, first of all, how critical it is for the executive team to care for the context of the organization or the, the values or the spirit of the organization. I like the analogy here, and if you know some of my work, you know I like metaphors and analogies uh, because I think it helps bring it home a little bit clearer. The analogy from the world of the honeybee. Apparently, in the world of the honeybee, queen bees don't make decisions and run operations. Their uh, primary role is to exude a chemical substance that literally keeps the system together. Well, of course, as leaders, we can't all just be queen bees and exuding chemical substances all day. We have to be some worker bees as well and get out there and help to make some things happen. But the spirit of the hive is critical. To what extent are we nurturing, fostering strong sense of connection, emotional connection to the values, the culture of the organization. So let's try to get a little more practical with that, a little more concrete. I'm going to use a framework here. We call it our compass model. And uh, it's at the head of what we call our transformation pathways, which have evolved over a couple of decades of work. Going back to one of my earlier books, Firing in All Cylinders, we used a cylinder model there. It was the forerunner of this, this approach. And then Pathways to Performance brought in the idea of pathways and evolved that model a little further. And now we've evolved it and tried to, uh, to simplify it in many ways to six major clusters or areas, each of which you can drill down much deeper into. And in fact, on our website and in a follow-up email that we'll send to you, 
will provide links into a lot of these models that I'm showing you here today, uh, but particularly in this one, you can drill down deeper into each of the pathways. So let's take a quick look at how it's put together. It starts with focus and context. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit later on about a bit more of this, but it's essentially the uh, three key questions. I've been in way too many vernacular engineering debates about is this a vision, the values, is this a mission, you know, what do we call all this when we move commas around and we try to, to pick the fly specks out of the pepper and, uh, and wordsmith things. So ultimately I think what it really boils down to is do we have agreement as a team and then throughout the organization on where we're going, question number one, where are we going, what do we believe in, call those values, aspirations, beliefs, Question number two, what do we believe in? And question number three, why do we exist? What's our purpose? What's our reason for being? That's at the heart, not at the head. Because all three of these questions are heart kinds of questions. So that's the beginning point. Then we put in the North Star position very deliberately the focus on our customers or whatever term you might be using for whom you serve or who's paying your bills. And the partners then are those internal and external people that help to make that happen. And so the North Star is about true northing ourselves to, uh, to that position. Then we want to make sure that we've got clear strategy and direction on uh, what are the priorities that are going to take us there. How are we going to measure our progress, maybe using things like balance scorecard and other approaches and reward uh, behaviors along the way. Are our processes and systems aligned? These days, things, tools like Lean, Six Sigma are used quite a bit in this area. Are they aligned? And then lastly is, are we building strong capacity and uh, skills, understanding, awareness, connections across the organization? So the burgundy areas are the leadership or the so-called softer areas. The blue areas are more of the management or more of the harder areas of this uh, approach. So how are you doing in terms of building culture capacity across those six crucial areas? And how do you know? That becomes a key question. How do you know? Do you have data? Do you have some kind of input? Or is it just everybody guessing, throwing guesses at each other? Well, teams not pulling together, and particularly I'm thinking here of the executive team not pulling together. And we've come to see a set of this functional executive behavior. Now there's a continuum here again where sometimes it's mildly dysfunctional, sometimes it's badly dysfunctional. Most of the times it's somewhere in the middle that there's some dysfunction across a couple of these dimensions. It may not be all of them. But again, I invite you to think about so to what extent might your team be falling into some of this. The first is where opposing views and real strong good debates and discussions aren't really happening around meetings and one-to-one uh, and, and -one or face-to-face, -face, but tend to go underground and, and aren't being addressed openly. Where perhaps part of that, a symptom of that, might be complaining, criticizing, talking about each other, uh, about other members behind their back. And a lot of times it's because there isn't a lot of comfort or skill on how to give people feedback. It is a skill. And it's an area that actually we've studied quite a bit and have developed a skill building module around. But we also know from a lot of our research in doing that work that many people avoid giving difficult feedback and instead might resort to this kind of feedback method, which is very unhealthy, but unfortunately pretty common, where we take little pot shots at each other and try to pass the message along, wrap it up. It's like putting a, a stone inside a snowball and you're throwing at somebody's head, and when they get upset, you say, well, I'm just throwing a stone, I was just having fun. Well, no, there was something buried in there that was hurtful, and it wasn't just fun. Now, obviously, you want healthy laughter index amongst teams. You want people to be able to kid each other and joke around and have a good time. That's a sign of a healthy team. But when it gets crosses the line into this kind of behavior, it's very unhealthy. And we'll last two points. This last second last one is around few vocal executives, oftentimes it's the leader of the group, but sometimes I often see a phenomenon where you have eight people on an executive team and they're in the midst of a good debate and you really have four people and four spectators. You really aren't having a good, healthy debate with everybody involved. 
And so partly as a result of that, someone might walk away because we heard four strong opinions and didn't hear from three or four others, walk away thinking, well, we've got a consensus here because nobody said anything. Didn't hear anything to the contrary, so we must all be in agreement. So how are your teams doing in terms of pulling together and potentially falling into uh, to some of those kinds of traps? Well, communication breakdowns. Of course, this can take many forms as well. Uh, executives not being united in their strategic priorities can be a, a common one. Or sending conflicting messages about what is or isn't important often shows up here. Not walking the talk, leading by example, so behaviors that aren't really modeling the culture or the values. And, and many times, many of the above come from executive teams and team members not getting good feedback on their behavior. And so they're blissfully ignorant in many ways and not even realizing that they're causing many of these kinds of problems. And so this also adds up to many times a problem with moose on the table. That was one of my previous books. It was my only work of fiction. And it was about this notion of there's this moose or elephant or whatever creature you'd like that's in the room or on the table and we're not talking about it. We're kind of tiptoeing around. We're passing things around its legs. We're, it's eating off of one end of the table, maybe dropping moose pies off of the other end of the table. Meanwhile, there's more and more moose tracks showing up all throughout the organization because we're not having courageous conversations. And so one of the things that we'll often do, and you'll see later, is in our retreats, we'll do some uh, moose hunting to try to identify what some of those issues are. Well, failing to follow through becomes uh, another failure factor. It's the last one I'm going to list here. Again, these aren't in any particular order. But it's certainly a common problem. And it really links back in many ways to the first one, the speed traps and tyranny of the urgent. So at one time, I was doing some interviewing work, doing some assessment work before a retreat in one organization. And I was trying to get a sense of the dynamics of the organization, the culture of the organization. And here's an actual comment. This is quoted verbatim. We have lots of projects, goals, and priorities. We're constantly making lists and setting action plans, but we seldom see anything through to completion Completion, before urgent new priorities come along. We seem to be operate by random brain impulse. We're like nervous water bugs with ADD that frantically flip from one thing to another. Well, again, I invite you to think about where are you at on that one, on, uh, on those uh, failure factors. And we'll come back to the screen to say, if you'd like to ask more questions or raise any of these uh, further, talk about them further, please go ahead and put that in. And I'll come back, back to that at the end. OK, so what are some of the uh, typical retreat configuration options? Well, first of all, I want to argue strongly for the need for our retreat. Way too many organizations are going 100 miles an hour, falling into the speed trap, and not stepping back periodically to look at what's working and what's not working. Here's a, another of a series of studies on this problem. And you'll recognize one of the authors there was the author to the speed trap uh, study, saying that what they found, this is a study now of over 500 managers in uh, a wide variety of organizations. And they said, well, we find that time is often cited as the big problem. Everybody has a problem with time. Of course, money being the other one, too. And in this case, what they found is that people were rushing around, checking emails, fighting fires, uh, racing from meeting to meeting. I hear people at conferences and meetings sometimes saying, how are you doing? You busy? Oh, yeah, busy, busy. Oh, really busy. And, and then they'll maybe talk about how many emails and meetings they're a part of. And I want to sometimes ask, well, are you bragging or complaining? We tend to get caught up in this as somehow it shows that we're, we're really doing a lot of work. But what was, was found way too many times is that it's a lot of wheel spinning. And so their conclusion was that only about 10% of managers, and that's pretty consistent with our research on extraordinary leadership, that extraordinary leaders, extraordinary teams are the top 10%. And so the very top teams and leaders are the ones that are much more purposeful and much more reflective and, in fact, spend more time doing the kind of work I'm about to take you through. And we see the evidence of that time and again in some of the best-run organizations 
They spend a lot more time reflecting and stepping back. So what are some of the options? Well, there's four basic options. This first one uh, on organization culture development is the core framework that I'm going to take you through momentarily. Then we'll look at some options around leadership and organization development. Uh, we'll look at coaching and we'll look at executive team building. Obviously where we need to start with any retreat is what are the objectives. I've listed here uh, a number of typical kinds of objectives. What are we trying to do? Well, you see the, the bolded words there around we want to get some agreement, we want to assess perhaps, or perhaps we need to define further or identify behaviors or leverage or align or pinpoint, set imperatives. A lot of those objectives are woven into what you're going to see here in the few, next few minutes and are, are typical of the sorts of objectives that we might begin with. We also then uh, can look at some potential pre-retreat options before we design the retreat and, design, and decide how to go forward. This is a bit of a collection of different approaches that could be used. No one or two are used every time. Sometimes it could be focus groups throughout the organization to gather some sense of where the organization is at. A wide variety of different sorts of surveys that might be used. Could be some personal interviews, one-on-one -on -one confidential interviews uh, with executive team members and or other significant players that might be coupled with focus groups as an example. I've had a lot of success with open-ended email questions where we take five or six key questions and have those uh, emailed back and then we compile uh, the responses. The extraordinary leader is a 360 process, which I'll touch on a little bit later on, can also provide there's aggregate reports that can be drawn up from that input on each individual leader that can give us a pretty good picture of the whole team and the organization. We might review current documents. This is a little more formalized, a little deeper kind of audit. Or we might even do a more criterion-based assessment where we take uh, some measurements and go in and look at each of those pathways in that compass model that we looked at earlier. So this is a wide uh, range of possible options. It's also very common that we'll do retreats without doing any of these. We'll just move straight into the retreat and do some of the assessment work during the retreat and, uh, and not do a lot of work ahead of time. So there's uh, a number of different possibilities. But let's take a look at uh, what the typical kind of framework for retreat foundation is. It usually starts with identifying two or three foundational pieces, either language or uh, concepts that we want to build around. I'm going to show you a few of the common ones that we use. I'm going to whip through these pretty quickly. Again, you'll be able to get this in the follow-up email if you want to look deeper at any of these. One that uh, we've used a lot is my more recent book, Leading or Growing at the Speed of Change, talked about lead, follow, or wallow. And it's built around this notion that leadership is an action, not a position. And that the key actions of leadership around how we influence, how we connect, how we change, how we deliver results. And so looking at it from that perspective, rather than a role or a position we're in, we then take a look at, well, which framing level, as we deal with change or as we deal with challenges in the organization, are we following, hopefully on the more hopeful side, the skeptical, hopeful, skeptical side, but if we're not careful, we can slide down into cynicism. If we're on the more positive, hopeful side, we're back up to leading as an action, not a, an action, not a position. How do we capitalize, move things forward? So that's what we're trying to build leader, leaderful organizations. The danger is sliding down into wallowing territory, where uh, we're seeing lots of conspiracies. They're out to get us. They're going to do it to us again. So we walk through this model. We have some fun with the model. But with executive teams, we often then talk about, so what's that look like for us? at the executive level. I once did a retreat where before the retreat I was invited for dinner beforehand and just to get to know the team and they were doing a little bit of an update around the, the table and I never heard so much wallowing in my life about how it's everybody else's fault and we can't do what we want to do because of everyone else and as we got into the retreat the next day we went through this process to their credit they owned up to that and realized that they were spending a lot of time in wallowing and began to recognize what that behavior looked like. And then as we talked about, so how do we keep ourselves 
out of the swamp, out of wallowing? How do we keep ourselves in leading mode? We started to generate some real good ideas for that. And then it started to ripple out into how do we now move this out through and down the organization. So that's one framework that we use. Sometimes if customer focus, customer service is a concern or where we want to focus the retreat, then we might look at a model that was in one of my previous books that we've used quite a bit over the years. We're trying to improve or increase customer perceptions of value that are with three rippling uh, impacts here, the basic product or service itself, how it's supported, and how it's enhanced. Or another way of summarizing it is this is meeting specs or requirements. This is identifying or meeting broader satisfaction factors. And out here, we're delighting our customers with going above and beyond with frontline service deliverers who are excited and delighted to be providing high levels of service to customers. Other times, another framework that we'll use quite commonly is the uh, triangle model or looking at this balance between technical expertise and our technologies, which in some organizations is very deep, systems, processes, ways we've organized ourselves, and all that people stuff. The customers we serve, like the three rings just got at, the partners, the people in the organization that are doing the serving. And so as we look at that model, we can see that we want to connect hands, head, and heart. Or to drill down a little bit deeper, we want to especially balance management and leadership, or IQ, good intellectual, rational thinking, planning, analysis, with EQ, so-called soft skills, such as emotional intelligence. So again, we use this model and go further into it and how it applies to the organization. But one of the, the key exercises here, then, is to take a look at, so where are we at? How would we assess our effectiveness across those, or sorry, how much time we spend in the is now column? Or do we spend half our time in the technical issues, a quarter, a third, 10%, what is it, and all the way down through? And then how much time should we be spending? And inevitably, when teams go through this exercise, we start asking, well, where do you want to have less time and more time? I've yet to see the pattern change where the team doesn't say, we need to spend a lot more time in leadership, which then leads us into often a rich discussion around, so why aren't we? What's drawing us into the technical and management areas and taking us away from leadership. And so a last model we might use, and again, it's a very rare we're going to use all of these in every retreat. We might use one or two, whichever is most pertinent. But it would be that pathways model that I just showed you a few minutes ago, where we're using it potentially as assessment or as a way of, of pulling together some of the key elements that we need to focus on. All right, so what are some other pieces of the typical retreat? Well, we might be reviewing pre-assessments that might have been done and bringing that in, uh, either here or potentially in and around some of the earlier models. Or we might be having the team actually do some assessment work at this point. So the pre-assessment options we looked at earlier, so we might look at some of that. We might, during the retreat, do these kinds of exercises. So here's an example of where we take the five or the six clusters of the compass model. And you're seeing a bit more detail there of each of the areas of the compass model. And so now we do some assessment on uh, where do we think we're at across that model. If we did pre-assessment work on this model, we would have gathered more input more broadly in the organization. Or I mentioned that we may be doing 360 uh, feedback using the extraordinary leader process. So here's an example of uh, an aggregate report and um, uh, survey feedback that looks at key competencies and how this team is doing against those competencies, uh, the, the team itself, I'm showing sample company, and what our global norms are. So we might bring in some of that kind of data. Or we might do, in the session itself, a strengths and shifts exercise, where we identify what are the key strengths that we want to leverage further that are holding us in good stead, that are, are, we're doing well? 
and what are some of the big shifts that we need to make in order to move ourselves forward. So again, there's a variety of different approaches there, but uh, this is the basic step of um, some kind of review and assessment. Then we move to the critical foundation piece of vision, values, purpose, or in case we get caught up in all the different words, where are we going, what do we believe in, why do we exist? So here are those three questions. Where are we going, what do we believe in, why do we exist? So having, in these days, some organizations have done quite a bit of work in these areas already, and we may not, need, we may, may not have to do a lot, in other cases, we may have to revitalize, brush them off again, uh, perhaps re-energize some of this, or in fewer cases these days, we may have to create some of these pieces because they don't have the pieces in place already. The key thing, of course, is not so much what are we saying here, but how well are we living these kinds of things, such as core values. To make that point, I like to use this example. Now, here's a company that wrote four core values. You take a look at them and you think, yeah, they're pretty well written. Yeah, that's pretty good stuff, fairly compelling. Uh, I could see signing up for that. I'd love to, to be in that kind of organization. Well, there's a difference between saying it and living it. This was Enron, largest corporate, corporate fraud in history, a company that went down flaming. It wasn't exactly living its values, but boy, they sounded pretty. They looked really nice. So. We, uh, we very much live by and, and emphasize that well-lived trumps well-written. Let's not get overly tied up in the wordsmithing. Obviously, we want something that connects and has an emotional connection. But it's how we live these values, the behaviors, that becomes absolutely vital. And so we spend a fair bit of time on this, this notion that, of course, the effect of a communication is face-to-face. But the most believable communication is behavior. And so defining what those behaviors look like. Now, there's a wide variety of examples that I could bring you here. I chose to bring one pretty busy example from um, a company we worked with a few years ago, which has changed ownership a few times at the time. It was FNX, a mining company. And they were focusing heavily on safety improvement, but also more broadly on just more effective culture development. And so what you see here is across the top the commitment that the company is making to everybody and to each other in terms of the four values. And then down below, we see in the middle what all team members, so everybody in the entire organization, what the behaviors look like for them. And then in addition to that, what leaders need to do to help bring those behaviors alive. Now again, these can, these can just be words on a paper unless we really bring them alive. We do call this culture on a page as a way of trying to summarize or put in one place what some of the, these behaviors are. But how we live them, of course, becomes absolutely vital. And then typically in many retreats, we end up toward this part of the session as we're going down the funnel. You start to look at this agenda and you see it as a broad open at the top, ideas going in and sliding down further down into the funnel. So we get down to moose hunting. Now moose hunting can take many forms. Could be done ahead of the retreat where we've gathered a bunch of input surveys, focus groups, etc., one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Or it could be at the retreat we've designed and, and evolved over the years a couple of very um, safe processes for everybody to input and the, the moose that they feel need to be addressed. Sometimes we use surveys along this sort of line. Uh, this is a, a couple of questions, uh, example, off of a survey that talks about uh, typical signs of moose problems. So we might survey the individuals, either in this group or a broader group, and get some input. And so if we're doing a survey like this, then we start to add up the scores, and we see the very best case, there's no bull. We see some, some survey or some problems there, 25 to 30, getting to the middle. We've got to watch out. Get down to the bottom. We've got a big problem. And uh, most times when I'm working with executive teams, it seems to be in around the last two points that um, comes up most frequently. So however we do it, we raise what the issues are. We have a discussion and make it safe again for people to identify what the biggest moose are. 
And then we move into identifying uh, action plans to address those moose, or what we think of as strategic imperatives. And so sometimes they're directly tied to a couple of specific moose. In other cases, the moose hunting has helped identify broader issues. And as we now step back and look at all the ground that we've covered here, in a two-day retreat, this is typically taking us to the afternoon of the second day, where we now step back and start to look at, OK, we've, we've said we want, here's where we're going, here, where we go, what we believe in, why we exist, three questions. We are now going to identify three to five things in a year or so, initiatives or imperatives we've got to move forward, or we're not going to get much farther along those imperatives. We're going to fall into the, the group that fails at doing this kind of work. And we're going to identify who owns each of these imperatives, how we're going to measure our effectiveness, how it's going to cascade down through the organization, and how we're going to follow through and follow up and keep all of it alive. And so this is a, a list of typical kinds of imperatives. Usually, again, we only want two or three. We don't want a big, long list like this. We just want to identify a couple of key initiatives that we can really zero in on, focus in on, and, uh, and build a strategic imperative team around that initiative. So a strategic imperative team is typically then somebody that manages the plan, pulls the plan together, and steers the execution. And so at a retreat, we usually start to set this up by beginning to talk about who might be the team leader. It could be somebody in that room, in the executive group, or it could be others that report to the executives or weren't there. Sometimes we do a two-tiered retreat where the first day and a half we had a larger group, 30, 40, 50 people, a couple levels of management. And then the last afternoon when we're into this discussion, we have maybe just the executive team, six or eight or 10 at the most um, executives who are then figuring out what to do with all of this and are setting up these strategic imperative teams and beginning to, uh, to roll all of this out. And so we need to then set up follow-up and monitoring process that uh, makes sure that we keep all of this alive. Because if we come back again to some more research, we see that one of the big problems is very few organizations have a good disciplined process for focusing top management's time. You look at Jim Collins' work, good to great, built to last, great by choice, all the excellent research he's done over the years, he says that discipline is the biggest difference between good and great companies. The discipline of follow through, follow up, pruning out things not to do, focusing on a couple of key issues and not getting caught up in big laundry lists, many of the things that we've been talking about here. So we want to make sure that we're not falling into the trap identified here where the urgent is crowding out the important. And we're focusing or trying to do multitudes of things rather than what's really going to leverage us and drive us forward. That's why we call it a strategic imperative. These are a couple of imperative things, must do things, that are strategic, that are high leverage to move us forward. And so we need to then staff up to those. So I've just taken you through the basic kind of uh, retreat format and process. A couple of very other variations might be where we're focusing in on leadership skills. So for example, this chart is showing weakness versus a strength approach and the kind of culture that we might want to build. And, and so it's using strength-based leadership. Here's some Zenger Folkman research that points to the critical need for the executive team to be strong individual leaders. And because leadership does flow downhill, and that the executive, executives need to be good examples of the, left, the right column here great leaders, where they're coaching, guiding, inspiring, fostering a culture, attracting, retaining, building magnet organizations that attract and retain the very best people. Good managers are good. That's great. It's nice to do a lot of those things on the good management side of things. But if we're really going to be outstanding leaders, we've got to focus in on the, uh, the leadership side and, uh, and build strengths on leadership. Some of the research that we have from uh, building strengths versus focusing on weaknesses 
Here's one uh, series of studies showing when leaders focused on fixing their weaknesses, they saw some improvement, which is great. There was some improvement. When they focused on building strengths, the level of improvement as perceived by everybody else around them through 360 process doubled. We even have some other studies and data here showing that it tripled. So focusing in on building strengths, that's typically by taking our strengths, the needs that the organization has, and our passion as leaders to find that sweet spot where these intersect so that we can take three to five strengths, the 90th percentile. Doing that, we end up leveraging the incredible power of strength-based. So this chart is showing if a leader is assessed as having no profound strengths at the 90th percentile, their overall effectiveness is pretty low. If they have one, it jumps to the 64th percentile, two takes us up higher. Look at what happens with three, four, and five. We see that we don't have to be good at everything. You don't have to be a uh, superhero to be an extraordinary leader. We have to figure out how to leverage our strengths and focus on those strengths. So in some of our retreats, uh, in that point number two, that's some of what we cover. In other retreats, we might be looking at uh, coaching and organization development, which is where, for example, we, uh, we make the distinction between training, which has lots of value and there's lots of need for training, mentoring, which is also incredibly valuable, and coaching. Too often what gets called coaching in many organizations is really mentoring or training, and that's fine, but if we truly are coaching Whereas you look at the points there, it's really about facilitating, enabling, fostering powerful discussion. That kind of impact, that kind of coaching can have this sort of impact on employee commitment. This is showing where strong coaching is in, in place. You see off to the right side there, the difference between the very right side and the very left side. There's a magnitude difference between strong coaches or outstanding or extraordinary coaches and just good coaches. And so sometimes in our retreats we'll get deeper into coaching. We'll talk about some of the, the common coaching traps. Uh, we'll often bake into the retreat the extraordinary coach process, which is a skill development, coaching development process that gets at many of these traps. And is built around this four-step fuel framework or fuel model, which is quite different. Some people know of the GROW model. This is quite a bit different than that. Uh, and so it's framing the conversation, understanding the current state, exploring the desired state, and laying out a success plan, all aimed at having the individual own the process and the problem and the plan, rather than if we're training or mentoring, too often it ends up with when you follow up later, well, how's my plan working out for you? because I haven't really built high ownership and involvement and empowerment on the part of the coachee. And sometimes we'll, as well, build deeper levels of executive team building into our retreats. And so that might look like this. We might do some assessment ahead of time for team dynamics and potentially dysfunctional behaviors. Might do some of that. We're focusing in a little more on working on the team and how it works versus just working in the team, which is a lot of what I've covered so far in this webinar. And of course, we're going to do perhaps even more or drill down deeper into moose hunting, as well as perhaps spending more time around team norms, ground rules. Perhaps there's some conflict, either overt or covert conflict um, in the organization that needs to be surfaced or that needs to be dealt with in one way or another. I have been in a couple of retreats where there was very strong conflict. We had to really use some good conflict resolution methods to break through that and, uh, and to take us to a new place. This is an exercise that's often very useful in executive team building, is where we start, again, this could be done some, some assessment work ahead of time, could be the open-ended email questions I talked about earlier, uh, or it could be done at the session itself where we identify what to keep, stop, and start doing. And inevitably, when we start zeroing in on things like time traps 
or some of those common traps we looked at earlier, or we look at the executive team and how it spends its time. Inevitably, we talk about meetings, committees, and email. And what are some ways that we can deal with those huge suckers of time and attention, who are, which are management or technical tasks. It isn't leadership in most of those situations, especially email. Email can suck up all kinds of management time, and it isn't really strong leadership time. All right, well, coming towards the end here, if, uh, if you have some questions you want to add, please go ahead and, and put them in there. And uh, I may not get to them here in the uh, in the last few minutes that we have, but we'll try to get back to you uh, with some responses. So I've covered quite a bit of ground over the last few minutes, and I want to stop with end with a bit of the payoff of a retreat, which is a bit where we began at the outset. Can provide some really strong leverage. You can really integrate and pull together a lot of efforts. Rarely are we trying to create new things. It's usually about integrating and strengthening the team, trying perhaps to begin to get agreement on our way, which might be the XYZ way, insert company name way process. Uh, so we might be using that as foundation building for an our way type of approach. This could be a great time to refocus and re-energize the executive team and, of course, build those cascading coalitions using the strategic imperative kind of approach. So in terms of next steps, uh, you, can, uh, you can find lots more information on, uh, on our website. This is some of the organizations we've worked with. If you want to get a bit more sense of our background and experience, uh, these are the kinds of topics that often in designing either a shorter workshop or a keynote or, or in the retreat itself, we might bring some of these kinds of topic areas. You saw me cover a few of them in the earlier foundation pieces. So we might bring that in. There is a section in the uh, website that looks exactly at those four areas of retreat configuration that I just uh, touched on. And uh, we are also scheduling a webinar coming up on April the 20th, which is to get down deeper now into the two areas I skimmed over briefly here which is building strengths, the zanger Folkman approach using the extraordinary leader and all the research around how we build strengths, which I didn't get into here today, and coaching, getting much deeper into how we build extraordinary coaches. So that webinar will be dealing uh, with that. And for those of you uh, in the Toronto area or might be able to get to the Toronto area by the end of June, I'm doing two one-day workshops that are, are the Extraordinary Leader and the Extraordinary Coach, which you can find lots more information on our website about, and we'll also be sending as part of our follow-up email. So in our follow-up email, you'll be getting a, an assessment survey, and so to try to add maybe a little extra incentive for you, we're going to give away autographed copies of uh, one copy each of each of my books that you see there, and uh, so we'll do a draw from all of the survey responses that come back in from the, uh, for those books. So at this point, uh, we've got a few minutes left. And for those of you who would like to even hang on a bit beyond our allotted one hour time, I'm going to uh, spend a few minutes taking a look at some of the questions that um, have come in. So um, some of these look like they're questions around just getting connected to the, uh, to the webinar. Uh, we will be doing a follow-up email. There's a few different questions about what's going to be available following the session. We will do some uh, follow-up with links and materials and where you can get lots more information. A couple of questions that I'll address are, uh, one is we have annual retreats where leaders meet, but very little changes. How can we fix that? Well, we've got some magic foo-foo dust. <laughs> Obviously, I, I, and I can't just suddenly um, diagnose this and fix it without knowing more of the detail. But I, I will say a couple of quick things, is that what often shows up is that we have a retreat where there's a lot of discussion and, and 
chatter, but it's not really focused. Now, I'm obviously very biased to the type of framework and funneling effect you just saw me walk through with a typical retreat format. I'm also very biased to using a professional facilitator, not only because you have a neutral outside person that can guide the conversation, but also that if you have a professional facilitator, you're more likely to have a much more successful outcome. That is some bias there, no question about it. And lastly, I would say that having real clarity about next steps, strategic imperative, follow through, putting uh, good strong plans in place, uh, all of those sorts of things are absolutely critical to uh, making sure that a um, that this is, is well, that the retreat is going to be successful. Someone else is asking, uh, covered a lot of ground, how do we get started, what's the next step? Well, possibly uh, the next step might be uh, a short consultation. We'd be happy to, to chat with you a bit more, or after you've completed the survey, we're going to be asking you some questions on the survey about what connected, resonated, et cetera, with you. There's opportunity on the survey to ask uh, whether you to, to ask for a little more consultation or have us talk a little bit further about how this might help you. So certainly, um, certainly would be happy to talk further about that. Question about are all retreats two days? Is there flexibility? Clearly, there's, there is flexibility. We have done one day kinds of increments. Um, have even done a retreat in one day. It's not ideal, but it's been done. And uh, or broken up into a couple of days. Or sometimes we want to get deeper. We'll take go into three days. I've done retreats as long as four days. So there's certainly a lot of different. Uh, kinds of options there, and we can uh, we can certainly chat about that more. And that kind of ties in another question around, we have a lot of our own models. How, do, how might we use those or adapt those? And I'm very much in favor of evolution, not revolution, and of integration, of pulling together existing things that you're doing and pieces, puzzle pieces that you already have in place and building the puzzle from that. So we do a lot of customizing, or tailoring around existing sets of values or models or frameworks or assessments or competencies or whatever the case may be. Last question I'll address, and then uh, our time is ticking away, is uh, asking about um, how do I get senior leaders on board to using the approaches that have been covered here? Um, and that's another one of those difficult questions, a short answer is, what is it that's keeping leaders awake at night? What are the issues that they really care most about? And can you connect those issues, whether it might be cost containment, retention, succession planning, improving uh, market share or profitability, whatever those issues are, being able to trace those back to culture and organization effectiveness and leadership and then ultimately to the role that the leadership team plays, as I've been arguing throughout here, in making all of that happen. And that's when you can tap into that, that sort of energy source, we've seen time and again, new budgets suddenly get created, or executives suddenly have much more time available to do this kind of work. And where we have trouble with budgets or time or those sorts of problems to get executives on board, is often because we haven't yet tapped into that energy, into what's really driving them to want to move all of this forward. Well, thank you very much for joining us. I hope that you have taken away a few gems here. We're uh, about to land, so put those seat belts up and uh, tray tables in the upright position. We have flown uh, in this last hour over a lot of territory. We will follow up with an email to give you, uh, if you want to land in a couple of spots and go down to ground level and take a much deeper look, you can do that. And of course, uh, we're available to follow up. I'm available to, to chat with you further around any of this. So uh, all the best.